Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this time. We bless your name for the privilege of looking at your word, because it's your word that gives us wisdom to live the life we ought to live. And we're asking you today, Lord, that you grant us real wisdom, practical wisdom, as we look at your word today in Jesus' name. We pray that you give us the grace and the spiritual strength to avoid anything that will ruin our lives. Anything that will destroy our families. Anything that will make us totally backslide and go away from you. Help us, Lord, in all our actions, in all our decisions, in all the things we think about and do. That will think about the eternal consequences of the things we do. Help us today, Lord, to be attentive to your word and to hear what you are saying. And to have the grace and the spiritual strength and stamina. To stand with conviction and do what you want us to do so that the blessings can be ours. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are studying the life of Lord, his wife, his children, the whole family. And we do not want, we don't want to pass by this kind of study without getting the best out of the study. Because actually all these accounts about individuals and about families that we read about in the Old Testament, they're reaching for our learning. It says in Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, reading in verse 4, tells us that we ought to learn lessons from all that we hear, all that we see of the Old Testament characters. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatsoever things were reaching a full time, that is, before this time, before the time of the New Testament, whatever things were reaching a full time, were reaching for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Now, all these things happen unto them, for example, and they are reaching for our admonition, for our instruction, for practical wisdom, upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so, as we see, we have learned many things concerning lost family. The Lord is instructing us to remember the things that happened to Lord, to his wife, to his children, to his descendants, so that we can really learn a lesson that will be indelible in our hearts. You know, when Jesus was about to leave and was instructing his own disciples, he made use of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he reminded them they had to learn. In Luke chapter 17, Luke 17 from verse 28 likewise also as it was in the days of Lord, they did eat they drank they bought they sold they planted they built it but the same day that Lord went out of Sodom it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all even thus shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed then he goes on and then he tells us in verse 32, remember Lord's wife. Remember Lord's wife. You also need to remember Lord's, and you, remember, you need to remember the daughters of Lord's, the whole family of Lord's. Today I'm talking to you, I'm basing the message on Lord's decision actually. And the conclusion, the consequence of the things that happened as a result of Lord's decision. The great consequences of small decisions. That's what we're talking about today. You'll find that in your life. Many things that happen. And the decisions you take. And the life you live. And the series of events that take place in your life. They actually come. And then they make up your life as well as your destiny. It's not the major, major big decisions alone. But the very small, little, minute, inconsequential decisions, you see, oh, this of no consequence. If I do this, what does it matter at all? I can do this, I can do this, I can do that, and it matters nothing. You'll find out as we look at the life of Abraham, that actually, 
and the life of Lord Proverbs that actually these things are very, very significant. The great consequences of small decisions. Let's back up to when Lord began taking his decisions. In Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. Reading from verse 10. And Lord lifted up his eyes. And he beheld all the plain of Jordan. That it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt. As thou comest unto Zohar. Then Lord showed him all the plain of Jordan. And Lord journeyed east. And they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwells in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwells in the cities of the plain. And preached his tent towards Sodom. And that's the decision that led to other events in Lot's life. He preached his tent towards Sodom. Of course, they started because there was a little disagreement, a little strife, a little conflict. Not between Abraham and Lot. But between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. And it was reported to Lot. And then Abraham knew about it. The things that are reported to you. So and so did this against me. So and so said this against me. So and so acted this way against me. And the things that are reported, you are not there. Those things happened in your absence. That report created a kind of rift, sheet, and separation. And then, Abraham said, Lord, it will not be right we are fighting, striving, having conflict, commotion, because of this little thing. If it comes to the world, and the thing we can do is that you take one part, I take the other part. If it comes to that, I think that will be all right. And Lord didn't say, no, Abraham, how can I leave you? You are the source of my blessing. You are the source of my prosperity. You are the source of everything of God. I had nothing when I came to you. And it was the result of my association with you, my fellowship with you, and my staying under your control and your directives and your teaching and your instruction and observing your manner of life. If as a result of that, I have what I have. No, I cannot separate. If we have to discipline these headsmen and these ones, I didn't know them when I knew you. If we have to discipline them and remove them, just to keep our fellowship. Abraham, you are more important to me than all the cattle, than all the herdsmen, than everything I see, than everything I own. Instead of Lord saying that, he decided. Before you blame Lord, you also you have decided a lot of times foolishly, carelessly. And you have said things, done things, decided things, because of some things that happened, not knowing that that decision you are taking, or that decision you are taking already, is going to affect a lot of other things in your life. In verse 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and seen us before the Lord exceedingly. That's, that's the choice he made eventually. When it came to our head, when the decision he took was now to bear fruit, Genesis chapter 19, verse 12. And the man said unto the Lord, Hast thou care any beside, son-in-law, or thy sons, or thy daughters, or whatsoever hand thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. All the country that stood there now, they were about to be destroyed. All the servants that went with him, nobody, none of them came out. Do you see the consequences we are talking about? If you are taking the decision, Lord, to remain with Abraham, you might lose a little thing. 
But you will not lose everything. Lord, if you are staged, and you are not decided to do that foolish thing, that careless act, you will have kept your wife, you will have kept your children, you will have kept your family. But he decided, because he was ignorant of the future. All he saw was the problem today. And the things we need to get done today, my joy today, my satisfaction today, my fulfillment today, my life today, what I want today, I'm the master of my faith and the captain of my soul. I'm not going to allow anyone, Abraham or anybody to control my life. I am going to take a decision I want. Lord, go ahead. You'll need the decision in chapter milestone 19 and eventually it came out you know the story in verse 26 and his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt that's the first consequence he lost his wife not only physically temporarily here on earth lost the wife from getting to eternity with God now verse 30 and not went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him for he feared to dwell in Zor and he dwelt in the cave he and his two daughters and the firstborn said to the younger our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth and these children were ignorant. Their geography was at fault. Their history lesson they had not learned. And the social studies they had not learned either. And the family connections they had not learned. They didn't know there was an Abraham somewhere. And they didn't know that there was any other family somewhere. They said there is no man in all the that will get married to us and do to us as it should be done so we can have children. They were ignorant. They didn't even bother about their mother. You can see the state of the family. All they wanted now is what we saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. They used to meet together, they marry, they get husband, they get wife, and they have children. We want children. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with, with him. That we may preserve speech of our father and they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in and lay with her father and he perceived not when she lay down and when she arose what a man and it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger behold I lay here tonight with my father I want to strike a note of warning here. When your children are getting old enough, and you see that your daughter, your girl, is already developed physically, as a father, you will not be wise, sleeping on the same bed, sleeping in the same room with that daughter. Bring temptation on the daughter. As a mother, when you see that your boys, your sons, are of age, you will not be staying in the same room with your sons for them to be seeing you when you are dressing up, when you are coming from the bathroom. It's dirty. It's immoral. It's not right. It brings bad, terrible, lustful suggestions into the minds of those boys that are growing up. And your boys and girls that are growing up, you put them in the same room. You make a separation, a demarcation, so that there will not be this unsightly, dirty, incest, fornication, immorality in your family. But uh, this man wasn't thinking. And then he says, let us make him drink wine this night also. And go thou in, and lie with him, that we may preserve see of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the young, the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Those were both of the daughters of Lot were charged by their father. And the firstborn bear his son, and called his name, what's the name? Moab. 
And the same is the father of the Moabites until this day. And the younger, she also bear a son and called his name ben Ami. The same is the father of the children of who? Ammon unto this day. Ammon and Moab. We're going to look at them. Number one, my point, the destiny determined by small decisions. Destiny determined by small decisions. Number two, defilement and destruction through small deviations. Defilement and destruction through small, small, small deviations. Number three, demonic delusion by small, slow degrees. Demonic delusion by small, slow degrees. Number one, destiny determined by small decisions. You see the decision that lost me. And you want to see the consequence of that decision. He decided he was going to pass out, he was going to separate from Abraham, he was going to leave alone, be free, be independent, let no man control you. You are old enough, stand by yourself, that decision to stand by yourself, that decision to allow no teacher, no pastor, no leader to control you, that decision to cancel a major part of the work of God. That says you should be subject to those that have rule over you. That decision to cancel out Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 from your Bible. That says to obey them that have the rule over you. And that you submit yourself and you obey their instruction because they are watching over your soul. As someone that will give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief because that's unprofitable for you. That decision to cancel out that. And to say, that's in the olden days, that's the old school of thought. For me as an adult, for me as a grown-up man, a grown-up woman, and I have my family to be submissive in the church, to any pastor, any leader, somewhere, not me. I'll stand by myself. You'll need the consequence of your decision up in front. And so we now want to see, in Numbers chapter 22, Numbers chapter 22, I'm reading to you from verse 4. Numbers 22, verse 4. And Moab, these are the descendants of Lord now, through that infant, through that immoral relationship. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company leak up all that are round about us, as the earth leaketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Baal, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, Cause me this people. This is Moab wanting to cross Israel. This is Moab wanting to block out Israel. Israel came out of, because Israel is Jacob. So the nation of Israel came out of Jacob. Jacob came out of Isaac. Isaac came out of Abraham. But Moab came out of Lord. Out of this immoral relationship. And Lord never taught these children, even after the mistake had been made, after the sin had been committed, he never taught them their connection with Abraham. So they said, Come, cost me these people. For they are too mighty for me, for adventure shall prevail, that we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab, and the elders of Midian, departed with the rewards of divination in their hand, and they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the word of Balaam. You see that in chapter 25, Numbers chapter 25, from verse 1. And Israel abode in Shichi, and the people began to commit order with the daughters of Moab. 
And he calls the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. You see, these Moabites already they had idols. And he began now to entice and to call the people of Israel to worship idols. And the people did eat and bowed down to their God. And Israel, the people of God, joined himself unto the altar. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye everyone, his men that were joined unto the altar. Look at verse 9. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. Caused by Moab. Caused by Moab. That all these people died. Twenty and four thousand. In Deuteronomy chapter twenty-three. Deuteronomy chapter twenty-three. Verses three and four. And an Ammonite coming from Ammon, the younger son. And a Moabite coming from Moab, the older one. Shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even unto the tenth generation. Shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. This is the consequence here. All these descendants and children that came into the world as a result of this immoral relationship between the two daughters of laws and laws. All those children that came, generation after generation after generation, they were not so, they will not come into the congregation of the Lord until the tenth generation and it's even put forever. They miss not only the fellowship of the people of God here on earth, they miss the teaching of the word of God, and they miss even getting to heaven at last. Then in verse 4 it says, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam the son of Baal, of Petal, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. In Judges chapter 11, and you see what happened with Moab, hey, about Ammon and the Ammonites. In Judges chapter 11, I'm reading verse 4. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. Hey, you can see this. That both Moab and Ammon and their descendants, all they were interested in was fighting against the children of Israel. And it was told in verse 5 that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Thor. And then in verse 6 it says, And they said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain, that we may fight for the children of Ammon. In First Samuel chapter 11, First Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And Nathan the Ammonite, the Ammonite coming from Ammon, came up and he comes against Jabesh Gilead. And all of them of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. Nehash the Ammonite answered them on this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may throw out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. All I want is just have reproach, blemish, disgrace, dishonor over Israel. That's what I'm interested in. Can you see Moab and Ammon? You see the little thing that parted between Lord's headsman and Abraham's headsman. Like rivulet flow. Like a little crack in the wall where some water passed by. And the crack kept on expanding, kept on expanding, kept on expanding. And the little conflict and the little problem and the little disagreement kept on increasing and increasing and increasing. Abraham is gone. Lord is gone. Moses is coming, is gone. 
just one come generation after generation after generation the conflict still continues the seed you sow today will grow up and you do not know where as the tree grows it will bear fruit and the winds of the air and the winds of circumstances and the winds of time will blow and scatter all the seed on the tree scatter it everywhere and get planted to another place again and begin to go the actions of your hand the decisions of your life the things you do today you do not know how it will go and go and go that's the very thing you need to understand your destiny and the destiny of all the people around you they are determined by your small small decisions looking at first kings chapter 11 first kings chapter 11 we're looking at moab and ammon moabites and ammonites in first kings chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 king solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of pharaoh women of the moabites ammonites edomites zidonians hittites solomon also got involved of the nations concerning which the lord said unto the children of israel ye shall not go in unto them neither shall they come in unto you for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods and solomon claimed unto these in love in verse 5 for solomon went after after the goddess of the zidonians and after meal come the abomination more of the Ammonites. And in verse 5, in verse 6, it says, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab. In verse 5, you see the abomination of the, Moab, the, abomination of the Ammonites. And then in verse 7, now you see the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, for Molech the abomination of the children of Ammon and in verse 9 and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart turned from the Lord God of Israel we shall appear unto him twice you see the problem as it continues and then as we move on and move on and move on as we get near to the end of the old testament that thing has not stopped is Stephaniah Stephaniah chapter 2 Coming to almost the end of the Old Testament, Sephaniah chapter 2, verse 8 through to verse 11. Sephaniah 2, verse 8. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon. The two of them are still there. The descendants are still there. And the consequence of what we read way back in Genesis, the consequence is still there. I've heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I least says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah. See, they came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah became destroyed. And then a decision was taken by these two daughters that they were going to have children through their father, law. Or maybe you think that what we'll do is we will not die. There is something worse than death. What we'll do it, and nobody can discipline us. In France, there is something more terrible than discipline coming from a human being like yourself. I will do it, and I don't care what they say. My friends, there is something more terrible than what the people say. It's not what they say. We're talking of the result, many years of results, a lifetime result. An eternal result of the decisions you are taking today. Whether we know it or not, whether we are able to deal with it or not, the eternal consequences of the temporary decisions that you take today. See all this. And then it says, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, God, the God of Israel, surely more shall be a sorrow 
And the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding nature and soul fields, and a perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnants of my people shall confess them. These shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will punish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even on all the hours of the heaven. Well, I've shown you from the life of Lord, that the decision of the moment, the decision taken in a day, led to a cursed destiny for many generations on earth and many generations in eternity. And that's why you want to be very careful of the decision to take, so that you don't destroy yourself by the decision of the moment or the decisions of the day, the decisions of the week, or the decisions of the temporary moment of time. Point number two, defilement and destruction through small deviations. Sometimes when the standard of the word of God has been set, some things then come to you that make you to feel that you can deviate a little. After all, it's a little deviation. After all, it's not a serious matter. It's just that we, need, we feel that because of the exigencies of the day, and because of the needs of the hour, and because of the peculiarities of the moment, let's deviate a little, and change a little, and, and touch it a little, and modify the word of God a little, and change our responsibility a little. Defilement and destruction through small deviations. In First Corinthians chapter five. First Corinthians chapter five. I read verse six first before I go back to verse one. In verse six it says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole Lord? Don't you know that a little leaven, a little deviation, a little corruption, a little gossiping, a little backbiting? A little anger, a little revenge, a little compromise, a little overlooking evil. We can't be talking every time. We can't be passing comments on everything. Say nobody is perfect, and no church is perfect. And there is no section of the church that is perfect. If we're, if we're talking about this and this, we will not move forward. So now what are we talking about? A little deviation there, a little deviation there, a little deviation there, a little deviation there. What are we talking about? These young people that are getting married, you know, because just because they didn't handle everything, the way we approach them in their wedding, in their reception, this little thing, is this what we are talking about? These people that just got children and they want to do a celebration, they are happy because they have children. We know what we have taught them, we know the moderation we have talked about, but a little deviation that they have done because of this and that, is that what we are talking about? These women that, you know, how, how are we to feel us on these matters of hair glue and, you know, and dressing and appearance, just because, you know, these ladies, poor ladies, this man will not leave them alone. He wants everything just as he has been teaching every time. Just a little division of, you know, cutting the thing here or leaving the breast open. Or being a little temptation to the men, if they can't, if they can't be able to close their eyes, just a little deviation in addressing, that's what we're talking about. So what are we talking about? Just because these are our children, a little thing, a little thing, this pastor is too strict about these things. Our children, if they don't have liberty to jump up and run down and misbehave, you know, little children are little children, they are children once in a lifetime, and they need to, you know, children need to be free, just let it go. And, and give, it gives some allowance to their stubbornness and self-will and, and their immorality and uh, their little children, a little deviation. All those little, little, little deviations, eventually it will have a very great consequence in defilement and destruction. That's why it says here, your glory is not good. Instead of dealing with matters as they arise. And instead of looking at your life and seeing the things that ought to be dealt with and still maintain that peace with God and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Instead of maintaining that righteousness and holiness, we look away from the righteousness. 
We look away from the holiness. We look away from the high demand and the high standard of God. And we're, we're blaming the person that says no deviation, no compromise there, no defilement there. All those things you are doing, stand straight, walk straight, and talk straight, and live straight, and dress straight, and behave straight. They don't want that. The little leaven. The little deviation. The little allowance of evil. The little allowance of compromise. The little allowance of sin. That's what destroys a family. That's what destroys a Christian. That's what destroys a community. Go back to verse 1. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And so fornication, as it's not so much name among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye have fought all, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I bear absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye have gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one, unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. What it means here is, leave him alone, deliver him to the devil, take the protection of the church away from him, take the covering, the prayer, the promise, the shield of the church away from him, throw him out, excommunicate him, get rid of him. When he gets out there, don't pray for him, don't beseech him, don't have anything to do with him. You say that's serious. Yes, that's how to deal with those little deviations that are coming in. Or that little leaven that is coming in. Get him out. Then the devil will submit him and torture him there. And then when he feels the pain of the sickness, and he sees that this is the consequence of my rebellion, and this is the consequence of my sin, this is the consequence of my, of my backsliding, then he will think about it, and he will repent, he will turn to the Lord, that his soul may be saved on the final day. Present pain to produce future pleasure. Present excommunication to produce future eternal joy. Present discipline, so that in the future we'll be able to have somebody that will return back home. That's what happened to the prodigal son. If everything had been all right in the far country, they would not think of coming back. But when he lost everything, and he came to need, and he thought, this is a consequence of my decision. This is a consequence of my evil. It was a pain, it was a poverty, it was a need, it was a pressure that came on him in the far country that made him to think again, I will arise and go back to my father. That's why when somebody is under discipline for any evil he has done, it shouldn't be in a hurry, get him back, get him back. No, let him feel the pain. Let him feel the pressure. Let him understand that sin brings punishment. Let him understand that rebellion brings evil. Let him understand that a little leaven is very dangerous for your life. Let him understand that when somebody leaves the path of righteousness and the path of rectitude, there is a consequence. Of course, you need to understand. When a father disciplines a child, the child will suffer. The father will suffer. Father? Don't worry about your own suffering, endure the suffering. Go through the pain. Mothers, when you discipline your children, and you deny those children of some things, because you want them to live right, those children are going to suffer. Mother, you will suffer too. There's the emotional agony and the pain you mothers will go through when you discipline your children, endure that pain. Just like your children, you need to endure the pain of the punishment and the pain of the discipline. Because if you don't endure the pain, you are going to leave the discipline on that child and you are going to ruin the child. Don't allow those children to just do what they want. And we pastors in the church, when we 
correct, rebuke, discipline people in the church. We sometimes suffer the consequence of that. There's a pain that goes along with discipline. And you preachers and coordinators and pastors and overseer endure the pain. Don't say because of the pain that you are going through, because of the discipline. You leave the discipline, see repentance before there will be restoration. So that a little leaven that is coming into their lives and into the church will not ruin and destroy the church. In verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that has called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one. No, not to eat. That's how serious it was. And that's how serious it comes to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. You've seen it in the family of Lord. You've seen it in your own family. You've seen it in your own life too. Your association, your interaction with people that were not living right. They have corrupted you. And your conscience now is added. Your conscience was tender before. Before you started mixing with all these hooligans. All these people that didn't understand the way of salvation, or the way of sanctification, or the way of holiness, or the way of righteousness. Before you started mixing with them, you were straightforward. You were tender. You were humble. You were gentle too. You were submissive. But as you communicated and interacted, for the people that have no conscience, also you are losing the tenderness in your conscience. That's the consequence of mixing with people that are not walking straight. In Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. A little leaven, leaveness, the whole long. Go back to verse 2. Behold, I Paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Don't let them tell you it's a little deviation. After all, circumcision or no circumcision, it doesn't matter. It's in the old covenant, it's no more in the new covenant. If you do it thinking that you'll qualify yourself more in the sight of God, Christ will be of no profit to you. Then in verse 6, for Jesus Christ, neither circumcision, availeth anything, nor circumcision, but faith which walketh by law. He did run well. Galatians, he did run well. Who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. Little deviation. Little deviation. Little deviation. He did run well. When you were born again. And the word of the Lord was given to you. The obedience to the word of God. The tenderness of your heart. The way you did your quiet time. And the way you obeyed the word of God. And the speech with which you made your restitution. And the way you were apologized, even to a fellow believer, when you have mistakenly done something, you did run well. And the way you were pray before you took any decision, even in little, little matters, and the way your conscience was tender, you did run well. Why? When you were first married, the way you relate to your husband, and the way you discuss together, and if there was any disagreement, you will say, my husband, let's take your decision, because the husband is the head of the whole. He did run well. Husband, the way you love your wife, and the way you will open up everything, and share everything, and you will not hide anything, either in your hide, heart, or in the bank, that your wife would not know. You did run well. Members of the church, the way you carried out the word of God, and the way you obeyed leadership in the church, and we didn't have to put our tongue in our cheek before talking to you and telling you what to do. And we didn't have to be afraid of you calculating and measuring and modifying our work before we spoke to you. We just spoke freely because at that time you were a new convert. You did run well. Where did these little deviations come in? 
These little compromises, where did they come in? This little hardening of the heart, where did it come in? This little, little insubordination, where did they come in? This justifying of sin and justifying of rebellion, when did it come in? This hardness of heart, when did it come in? You did not well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not from him that calleth you. This new persuasion of forgetting the standard of the word of God and taking laws into our hands and deviating and deviating and deviating. This persuasion is not coming from the Almighty God who called us into glory and into virtue. That's why it says in verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb. That's the reason we need to come back to the Word of God and understand that there will be defilement and destruction through the small, small, small deviations. A song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, reading from verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Our vines have tender grace. The little foxes, the little foxes, the little, little, little things that spoil the vine. The Christian life is like the vine, very tender. And if you allow the termites to come in, little leaven, a little immorality, a little pornography, going over the internet, fooling yourself. And getting into pornography on the internet. The pornography in the magazines, in the literature. The pornography in the writers of those people that do not know the Lord. Did they make the magazine for you born again Christians? All those things on the internet that will corrupt your life and corrupt your nature. Did they put it there for you? Three dreams on your way to heaven. Did they not put it for their people? Who are on the Broadway? All those little, little parts of pornography and the little lusting and the appearance of evil and association of sinners and the little line, little line, little line to cover up. We even cover up Christians nowadays. A believer, a member of the church. It's not done right. And because we don't want the leader to rebuke him, we cover him up. White lie has come into your life. Little lie has come into your life. You cannot get straightforward answer from a Christian nowadays. And it's those little, little things that will destroy your life and defile you and get you to hell if you don't repent. The little gambling, the little drinking, the little smoking. How about the little silly? How about the little gossips? Tell the army. And little worldliness. And the little closeness to Sodom and Gomorrah. We're not totally in Sodom, but we're close to them. We're not totally in Gomorrah, but we're close to them. And we're moving closer and closer and closer. And you are closer to Sodom and Gomorrah today than you were 10 years ago. How did that come? Beware. You are treading the path of laws. And you are getting closer and closer. Eventually you are going to get inside Sodom and Gomorrah. All these arguments. If they say television is bad, how about this, how about that? If they say television is bad, why are they recording video? If they say television, all that argument. You are taking steps, going towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. The dresses we used to wear, women that will have sleeves, we started cutting the sleeve. Cut one inch of this year. Another year cut another sleeve. Another one inch. Another year cut another one. While we are cutting the clothes, we are cutting our conscience too. So that pastor will not be able to say anything. Ah. If you have a pastor that can talk to you and correct you and challenge you and chastise you and rebuke you, you are lucky. 
when you get on the other side of the line and God says, Pastor, leave him alone. He's Ephraim. He's mixed with idols. Leave him alone. When he leaves you alone, you are gone. If you have somebody that is still able to say, my friend, you are going on your way to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the path of hell. This one you are cutting and cutting. You will soon cut everything up and be like Sodom and Gomorrah. This hairstyle you are changing, little by little by little. This perfume you are using, little by little. This powder you are touching, little by little. This lipstick is because my lips are dry. That you are using, little by little. You will soon get inside Sodom and Gomorrah proper, proper. If you have a pastor that is still warning you how lucky you are. That the Spirit of God doesn't want you to totally perish. Because you see what happened to Lord. And that's why the Lord is using us. I know there are people there that will want us to close our mouth and not talk. But we will talk. So that eventually, if you get to the other side. And I will be on the good side. I'm telling you. The rich man will see Abraham on the other side. And will see Lazarus on the other side. If you get to the other side, because of these little deviations, little deviations, little deviations, that eventually amounts to total backsliding in your life, you put your hand in the mouth like this, a hand of regret, you'll never be able to pull it off. Then you will remember that man there, he told us, we spoke against him, we rebelled against him, we tried to close his mouth, we tried to do whatever we could do so that we can use bold faith, so that he would leave us alone. He didn't leave us alone. He suffered for it, but he kept on telling us, you will remember, I should have stopped by now, with all that I've seen, with all that I've gone through, and some people tell me I've not seen anything yet, they tell me more, it's still coming. I should have stopped. Talking about holiness and righteousness, talking about restoration from backsliding, I should have thought, but I'm not stopping because on the other side, you will remember I told you. But you will regret that what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what shall man give in exchange for his own soul? In James chapter 3, little, little things that cause great, great problems. James chapter 3, verse 5 and verse 6. Even so, the little tongue, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindled. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. That it defileth the whole body and set it on fire, the whole course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. Proverbs chapter 26. In Proverbs chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. As a madman who casteth fire, brands, and arrows, and death. So is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, and not I in sports. Nowadays, they say they are believers, they joke with lies. They joke with deception. And, it was, and when you eventually discover, ah, my brother, that thing you told me last week, it's a lie. Ah, it's everything you say. You don't even know when somebody is playing, when somebody is joking. Eh? I was only joking. The joking was lie. Joking was deception. How can you play with sin? What only play was that? I didn't need to mean that. What did you need to mean it? If you are concerned, you mean what you say. That's why it says in this verse 18, as a madman. Who casteth fire, brands, and arrows, and death? So is the man that deceiveth his neighbor. And said, was I not plain? I'm not I in sport? You see, number one, destiny determined by small decisions. Number two, defilement and destruction through small deviations. Number three, demonic delusion by small, slow degrees. Little by little by little by little. 
to get into very net and the grief and the cage and the captivity of Satan and demons. In First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. Verses one and two. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, it happens little by little. The conscience doesn't become hard just over a moment of time. It's by slow degrees. It's by small degrees that eventually the devil takes over and the demons take over. And the things that used to bother us before, that you couldn't do before, that you couldn't say before, that you couldn't drink before, then the devil brainwashes you, blindfolds you, hardens your conscience, then you even go to doctrines of devils. You can even go to their prayer meeting and they may do some demonic things and it doesn't bother you anymore because your conscience is dead. In Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. Even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, lying wonders. They are wonders, but they are wonders of deception. And with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. They received not the love of the truth. The truth is not the highest thing on their agenda. The truth is not the highest thing in their desire. The truth is not the greatest thing in their possession. There are some other things they are thinking about. And those things they are thinking about, if, if that thing is going to be affected, they don't mind to do anything against the truth. But all the stillableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They even get to the point, they now actually completely believe a lie. They tell the lies so often, they act the lies so often, they actually now believe that lie to be the right thing to do. In verse 12, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ warned us that in the last days there will be people that will appear to be performing miracles. And they might have some semblance of miracles, but it's just to deceive people. Matthew chapter 24 verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. And shall show great signs and wonders. Jesus called them great signs and wonders. And there are people here today, if they hear of miracles, signs, wonders, healing, deliverance, prosperity, childbearing, getting a wife anywhere, they will go. They don't mind their doctrine. They don't mind any other thing they say. They don't mind whether they are defiled in their way of living. They don't mind any other thing they see there. All they want is a miracle. But Jesus said, you can come into demonic delusion by slow, small degrees. As you are considering those miracles. See, after all, they are praying in the name of Jesus. After all, they are reading the Bible. They are reading the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses also read the Bible. Some Catholics also read the Bible. Candle bunny, white garment people also read the Bible because they are reading the Bible. Whatever is taking place there, uh, because if we are listening to all this sound, sound doctrine, sound doctrine, uh, we will never get what we need to get. You want to go and get something from Satan? Jesus Christ himself said, if it were possible, they will deceive the very elect. And then he said in verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. In Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. I'm reading from verse three. But I fear, lest by enemies, 
as a serpent deceived the girl's feet. Through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their words. The Lord is warning us that if we give heed to these small decisions that are negative, and small deviations that end in compromises, and by slow degrees we are removing the ancient landmarks, and our lives are changing for the worse, not for the better, slowly and slowly and slowly, we may end up with demonic delusion. In Psalm 106, Psalm 106 from verse 35. But they were mingled among the heathen, and they learned their words. Isn't that true of many of us today? We have mingled with the heathen, and we have learned their words. We have learned their attitude. We have learned their actions. We have learned their irreligious, promising life. In Bataka State, and they search their gods, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. The children of Israel, little by little by little, they launched the way of the heathen. Can you think of the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The children of Israel eventually get into the point where they sacrifice their own children to the devils. This is just one day. So by slow degrees, they came into that delusion. That's the reason the Lord is calling upon you today and telling you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standing, take it, let it fall. I reveal the word of God to you today, that the small decisions you are taking today will determine your destiny. And the small deviations can result in defilement and destruction. And if you are changing by slow degrees, you can eventually get into the trap of the devil and be deluded. The deception will cause your decline. The decline can result in delusion by slow degrees. If you think you are all right today, therefore let him that thinketh his standard take it, let it fall. Where do you stand today? Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Those little, little excuses, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. That's what makes people backslide. I'm no more a little boy, I'm no more a little girl. You can't be talking to me like that. They won't control me like that. I'll show them that little, little, little kind of decision to rebel. You know that that thing can land you in hell forever. The only is too much. God is love. God is not as difficult as that. I will do it. Let come what may. Ah. That little rebellious attitude can land you in hell fire forever. You determine your destiny by the decisions you take from day to day. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they preach. I know what I'm going to do. That little momentary decision can ruin your life and ruin your family. After all, it's Abraham God. Without Abraham, I can live anywhere I want. And I will still keep my faith. I know myself. Ah, that little decision can ruin your life, can ruin your family, and send generation, generation, generation after you to hell fire. 
little, little, little. Those are the things that destroy the world you have been warned today.